When is the last time we truly examined our hearts? I mean, really looked inside. Will we find a heart that is truly devoted to God? Or will we find all types of clutter in there that gets in the way of our true devotion to God? When we allow all manner of things to clog up our hearts and lives, many spiritual problems can occur. First and foremost, our loyalty to the God who deserves all glory, honor, and praise. In this episode of Groundwork, we'll see how two prophets, Nahum and Zephaniah, address how God feels about these types of compromises and what he does about it. Join us today as we learn more about the character of God and what he may require of us next on Groundwork. Welcome to Groundwork, where we dig into scripture to lay the foundation for our lives. I'm Scott Jose. And I'm Daryl Delaney. And Scott, we are in part four of our six-part series on the minor prophets. And we have said that minor means not that they're less important, right. but because the books are smaller in nature, as opposed to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel would have longer chapters. They're called the major prophets. And we call these books the minor prophets. And we went through Obadiah, Joel, Amos, and Micah. And today we're going to go through the books of Nahum and Zephaniah. Nahum in particular, and maybe Zephaniah, are uh, people are a little more familiar with Amos and Micah, maybe less familiar with these two, so it'll be good to dig into them. Nahum, we think, prophesied in the early 7th century BC during the reign of King Manasseh of Judah. One of the ways I always remember, Darrell, what Nahum is about is the letter N, Nahum preaches against Nineveh, the same city that Jonah had gone to once. And whereas Jonah is preaching, despite the fact that it wasn't the outcome Jonah wanted, at that time, the people of Nineveh repented, maybe in around 760 BC, but they relapsed. And so now, a little over a century later, Nahum is almost a sequel to Jonah, and he has to come and predict the upcoming destruction of Nineveh because of their complete rebellion against God. And in the earlier series, we did talk about the book of Jonah mm -hmm. and how he reluctantly went to the people of Nineveh and said the message of repent or God's going to destroy it. They turned around and the book, because it ends abruptly, uh, we assumed that Nineveh just went and flew straight and went to the right way. And we realized that when we look at the book of Nahum, they did not. And so even though Nahum's name means comfort, everything in this book or a lot of the things in this book are not comforting to hear because God is upset because they have violated his law and he must address it through this prophet. And that's exactly what he does. It begins, the message concerning Nineveh came as a vision to Nahum who lived at Elkosh. The Lord is a jealous God filled with vengeance and rage. He takes revenge on all those who oppose him and continues to rage against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. So you're right, not a lot of uh, comfort <laughs> from the prophet whose name means comfort, but a lot of truth coming there. So, you know, I was thinking about how God is upset in this, and it talks about how the Lord will not let the guilty go unpunished, which harkens back to God's character display on the mountain with Moses in Exodus. Mm -hmm. A lot of people struggle with the fact that God shows this wrath, this rage, this frustration, this anger, and he wants to destroy anyone who opposes him. The reason why I think a lot of people may struggle with it is because we got the God of the New Testament and after the cross and after the atonement that is full of love and mercy, but they don't necessarily have to be opposites. God could be upset because he loves. He could be upset because he has been one who cares a lot. God could be jealous because he loves. And it's not the same as the jealousy that we have. It is often said that in insofar as God gets angry, it's love offended. Mm -hmm. uh, we've said many times here on Groundwork, anger and wrath are never core characteristics of Israel's God. Only love and loving kindness is. But when that love is offended, then there has to be some consequences. And he's called a jealous God. We've pointed this out before, too. Jealousy is not envy. Envy is a deadly sin, and there's no such thing as good envy. Right. Jealousy is not a necessarily a sin. Jealousy is when you want to keep what is rightfully yours. Israel deserved to give God all their love, but they were giving them to false gods. And so God uh, rightfully wanted to keep what was rightfully his, which is his people's love. 
And all honor, all praise, all glory, and all faithful love goes to God. And so when it goes somewhere else, God has a problem with it. And the Assyrians in this passage, they are the ones who were known for their arrogance, for their cruelty, for oppressing other folks. They were actually doing everything that God said not to do. And God is interested in bringing about justice, but not only justice, he's interested in bringing hope as well. And Nahum 1.7, you know, shows what God's core characteristic is. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. He is close to those who trust in him. So when we trust in God, we find all the goodness of God. Just, you know, God's just waiting for an excuse to love us. Um, and, and when we trust him, he will. But When God finds people not trusting him or actively turning away from him as the people of Nineveh were doing, there has to be some consequences. And so, you know, it could be very easy for us to fret when we notice that it looks like evil is winning in the Mm. world. When we turn on the news and we see bad things happening, we can say, well, where is God? I mean, I, I realized, too, in my own personal life that when my mom struggled with addiction, I was wondering where was God when she was struggling with these things. But I do realize that even though God didn't cause those challenges that she has in her life, he did work in spite of them because he showed me that it is a place where you can learn to be compassionate for people who suffer through different addictions and different problems. But he also showed us what it meant to trust him when he didn't have a quick fix answer for some things. And I believe God has a date on the calendar when he would address certain things. It just won't happen immediately. Right. And so what we see in Nineveh and God in um, Nahum 2 and 3, I mean, he says different times, I'm your enemy. I'm your enemy, which is a terrible thing to have to read. (laughs) But God is saying, look, in the longest possible run, I'm going to right all wrongs. I'm going to correct all injustices in the world. That's in the long run. But every once in a while, we get kind of like sneak previews of that. And, you know, that we have individual instances of God doing that in a specific situation. And though that's terrible to see— the good news there is that it reminds us that God is a God of justice. And at the end of the day, evil's not going to win. Bad things aren't going to be the final word. Bad people aren't going to finally get away with everything. Victims are going to be elevated and healed. And what happens to Nineveh is just like a, a small example of God's ultimate goal to restore the whole world to the goodness and the delight and the flourishing that God intended when he created this world. And the beautiful thing is that that theme keeps showing up, not only in this book, but also in the book of Zephaniah, which we're going to get into next. So stay tuned. We're glad you've joined our Groundwork Conversation. If you're enjoying today's discussion and want to download or listen again, you can find the audio podcast and transcript for this episode on our website, groundworkonline.com. Want to dig deeper? You can also find episode guides and blogs available to supplement your study. Curious about another episode or series we've mentioned? Search our episode library to find hundreds of conversations about God's Word and what it means for God's people today. Add your voice to our Groundwork conversation by visiting groundworkonline.com. And thank you. Support from listeners like you makes Groundwork possible. You're listening to Groundwork, where we dig into Scripture to lay the foundation for our lives. I'm Scott Jose. And I'm Daryl Delaney. And Scott, we are now going to move into the book of Zephaniah, who is another prophet. He is actually prophesying during the time of King Josiah. In the 7th century, he is actually doing this in the time of the southern kingdom in Judah. And they have been moving away from uh, God for a long time. And they actually uh, are doing some of the same things that Nahum was talking about Assyria was doing, which is worshiping other gods and moving away from God with their hearts. So uh, Zephaniah is working not too long before the 587 B.C. destruction of Judah and Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. And basically, Zephaniah is here to tell Judah why that bad thing is going to happen. You have sinned. You have turned completely away from your covenant obligations, from the law of God. Like the other minor prophets that we've looked at, like Micah and Amos, they've trampled against the poor. They're full of injustice. And worse yet, we find out very specifically here in Zephaniah 1, they've actively turned to false gods and to some terrible ones at that. It says in chapter 1 of Zephaniah, it says, The word of the Lord came to me, Zephaniah, son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah 
the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, during the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. When I destroy all mankind on the face of the earth, declares the Lord, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will destroy every remnant of Baal worship in this place, the very names of the idolatrous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host, those who bow down and swear by the Lord and also who swear by Molech, and those who turn back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. So it's a little hard to know um, in this passage, Gerald, what to make of his saying he's going to sweep away every living thing from the earth because after the flood, God said he actually was never going to do that again. But this seems to be an image to get Judah's attention that, uh, look, God is a God of justice and don't think that you will be spared the wider judgment of God just because you are, you fancy yourself as the people of God. Uh, you know, we get that image in Jeremiah where the people would go to the temple and they would just repeat it over and over. This is the temple, temple of the Lord. Lord, the temple, temple of the Lord. Lord. Like, we're safe here. You know, as long as we come to the temple, God won't see the bad things we do. And Zephaniah is here to say he's seen it. And worse, he sees that your worship is hollow as an empty rain barrel because you are trying to worship God at the same time you are worshiping Baal. And worse, you are worshiping a God named Moloch. And we know from the ancient Near East, Darrow, that Moloch worship often involved what has got to be about the most horrifying thing we could think about, and that is child sacrifice. And if that was actually happening in Israel, wow, that is the polar opposite of what God called his people Israel to be. It is definitely the opposite of that. Uh, worshiping other gods goes against God's Ten Commandments. I mean, the first one mm -hmm. is I'm the God. There's no other gods before me. I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. And then no graven images, no anything made from man to be worshipped and be honored. Only God gets that honor and glory. But that word of them worshiping other gods was not just an indictment on what Judah was doing, but it was an indictment on all the surrounding countries in the wider world of Philistia, Moab, Ammon, Ethiopia, and Assyria. And and God would not tolerate being disrespected or usurped by anybody else. He is the God that needs to be worshipped, and God is very serious about worship. As we've seen in other programs in this Minor Prophet series here on Groundwork, Daryl, when worship takes place in the context of injustice, not only does it not please God, it makes him sick to his stomach, mm -hmm. right? It's worse than not having worshipped at all, and that's what he is accusing them of here. They're, they're worshipping the starry host, right? The Bible clearly teaches we worship the creator, not the creation, right. but they're messing that one up, too. Are they doing anything right on the worship front? It doesn't really sound like it. And I think, Daryl, you know, we could um, wonder about this ourselves. I, I saw a cartoon one time of two guys kind of look like they're thugs, kind of not, not so good looking guys leaving church. And as they're going down the front steps of the church, the one guy says to the other, well, at least on the good news front, I ain't made no graven images lately, right? And also we might think, well, we don't worship Molech or Baal, but, you know, Tim Keller wrote a good book called Counterfeit Gods, where he pointed out no, but there are other things that can mess up our pure devotion of worshiping God alone. If we think about it, anything that takes our time, attention, and resources away from God, it could be good things. They don't necessarily have to be right. evil things, God. Like I could scroll on my phone for six hours. That doesn't mean it's productive, and it doesn't mean that that phone is evil, but it does mean that my heart is not fully devoted because I'm distracted. So I need to go through my life, and I would recommend that we pray about this. So God, what in my life is taking time, attention, resources away? Maybe I work too many hours at work. Maybe I don't spend enough time with the people that I care about or the people I'm not even available for God to serve him. This is a way to actually examine ourselves to see where our worship heart really is, because we don't want to just go through the motions. Right. And since we want to finish up so looking at Zephaniah um, in this part of the program, before we do some practical considerations in the third part of this program, let's just touch on, Daryl, briefly, uh, another major theme in Zephaniah, where he keeps predicting what is called the great day of the Lord. 
Lord. He mentions it 15 times uh, in the book of Zephaniah, the day of the Lord. Uh, we might call it judgment day. We often kind of pop in a popular way refer to it that way. This is the ultimate time when God's going to undo all wrongs. And it is a two-sided coin, the day of the Lord. I mean, it's a day of judgment on the one hand. God has to address sin. But it's also a day of restoration where our merciful God heals and forgives and redeems. And even though Zephaniah, like Nahum, has just got a lot of doom and gloom in this third chapter, wow, there's some great things here. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. And, Daryl, you know, when I read those words, it shows how Zephaniah, even with the judgment that is necessary to speak, it's on the trajectory to the cross, right? We are headed toward the cross of Jesus Christ, where God ultimately and finally will take our punishment away from us, the one we deserve, and puts it on the shoulders of his son, Jesus Christ. And really, this day of the Lord that Zephaniah talks about 15 times in his book is heading us straight toward Golgotha. Yeah. In humility, we are to receive that gift of restoration through Christ. And we're excited that God has already thought out that plan and he has laid that plan into motion. But as we wrap up this episode, we want to get into some practical applications from the two books. So stay tuned. Many people think that the Bible doesn't have much to say about life's practical challenges. But the Bible addresses our daily lives more than we might know. For April 2024, Groundwork co-host Daryl Delaney wrote a series of devotions titled God's Answers for Life's Challenges for our sister ministry today. Through each devotion, Daryl examines what the Bible says about God's care for us and how he encourages and strengthens us no matter what situation we face, lovingly giving us what we need when we need it. Then you're invited to join a live webinar with Daryl on Thursday, May 2, where he'll answer many of your questions and share his passion for helping others see God's story in their lives, even in the most challenging times. Find Daryl's devotions, register for the live webinar, or submit a question for Daryl at groundworkonline.com slash answers. I'm Scott Jose, along with Daryl Delaney, and you're listening to Groundwork. And this fourth episode in a six-part series on the 12 minor prophets, so we're hitting nine of the 12 in this particular series, and we're hitting two of them. We've been journeying in this program with the prophets Nahum and his words of judgment against Nineveh principally, and Zephaniah and his words of judgment against Judah. But also, as we just saw, Daryl, Zephaniah also has major themes of hope, that God is aiming finally for an ultimate restoration of forgiveness, that God is going to take our punishment and take care of it some other way. And we just said that ultimately, as New Testament people, we now know that that some other way was through the incarnation and then the death of God's own Son. And because God has done that, he has actually empowered us and incorporated us into his plan. And I think that's one of the things we can see as a practical application of the book of Nahum is to understand that we're called to be agents of transformation and ministers of reconciliation in our current situation and in our context. We may see brokenness in relationships. We may see gossip. We may see discrimination and we may see inequity, but we're called to step into those spaces and use the voices that God has given us to speak truth to power, to bring grace and mercy and love into that situation, using the power of Christ to do so. And as we wrap this program up, again, a major theme in Nahum and Zephaniah, but maybe even more in Nahum is justice. And today, too, justice, by the way, and righteousness are very similar in the Bible. And that's what we're called to be uh, in our lives, Daryl, is disciples of Jesus now. We're supposed to be conduits of God's justice. We're supposed to be people who ensure fairness in life, that we treat others with respect. We seek reconciliation when there's conflict. Uh, We try to avoid any kind of discrimination. We really want to see in the church, and hopefully if the church can set the example, maybe wider society will catch on to, to create really a community, a culture of equity and kindness. 
And when we do that, I mean, Christ says it in Matthew 25, that when you do this for the least of those, mm. you do it for him. So you're actually ministering to the Lord while you let your light shine in that way. And I think also, as we pull from Zephaniah, I think the importance of humility, knowing that it is God who made us and not we ourselves. He is God and we are not. And he deserves all our true devotion. That's one thing. But the other thing is that when we do mess up, not if, but when, when hmm. we make mistakes, we are supposed to confess those to God, confess those to one another so that we can be brought back into fellowship and relationship with one another. It takes humility to admit you're wrong and that you messed up. And that's all God wanted. He wanted them to admit they yeah. were wrong so he could bring them back. These messages of justice and judgment that we've seen in both Nahum and Zephaniah and we've seen throughout the minor prophets in this series, tough to hear and tougher yet when we, uh, as we've been doing uh, and we must do when we turn the camera on us <laughs> yeah. and say, hey, we're the ones, you know, it's like Nathan with King David, you are the man, you know, and so I am the man. <laughs> That's tough. And it does take humility to say, okay, yep, I admit it. I need to lean into my identity as a new creation and not do what I have sometimes done, and that's gone the other way uh, and, and sinned. So it does take humility to do that. In humility, uh, we, we are gentle with other people because they fail the same as we do, the same as I do. We want to live under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And Paul talks about that a lot in the New Testament, including in Colossians 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all things such as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self with its being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. So we are, as Paul says in another place in Corinthians, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent Christ wherever we go. In the books we study today, Nahum and Zephaniah, the people of God forgot that. They forgot that they were supposed to be ambassadors for God, right. for Yahweh, the God of Israel, to other nations. Instead, they acted just like the other nations. So they couldn't provide, you know, a witness to God when they were acting just like the people who didn't even know God and hadn't been called by God to live better. We know God. We have been called. We have been baptized, right? So, you know, when Paul says, you know, uh, you have been raised with Christ there in Colossians 3, that's pointing to baptism. Yeah. And you were raised as a new creation. You are now a representative of Christ to those around you. And that should mean that you do stand up for the rights of others, you stand up for justice, you stand up for fairness, you stand up for equality. These aren't political issues, they're gospel issues, right. deeply biblical issues, because what they all combine to achieve, if we could actually do it perfectly, would be shalom, you know, that, that wonderful shalom that, that is God's goal for all creation. And that shalom means that nothing is missing and nothing is broken and everyone has what they need. And that has always been God's ultimate goal to bring us back to shalom that was broken in Genesis 3 and just went downhill from there. Um, he has been warning and trying to get people's attention to bring them back to him so that he can be the one to restore them. And that is one of the messages that both Nahum and Zephaniah is trying to get to us, that we have a God who cares, who is intervening in our situation, and he wants us to come back to his plan and the way he does things so that he could use us to be agents of transformation. Exactly. When we opened this program, Daryl, you, you mentioned, you know, when was the last time we really looked into our own hearts? When, when did we do a heart check to see if we are worshiping God purely, serving God purely, or if there are other things that are cluttering up our lives, getting in the way of undistracted worship, getting in the way of being an ambassador for Christ? Uh, and I think that's uh, really what God is calling us to do. It's called, you know, also to go back to Paul, it's called our daily dying and rising with Christ. We die with Christ because we we have sins always to repent of, so we, we die to that all over again, and then we rise to newness of life, hoping that God um, not only will forgive our sins on an ongoing basis, which he does, 
but that on an ongoing basis, God, by his Holy Spirit, will call us back to our better selves, which are the new creation in Christ. So Nahum and Zephaniah reminds us that is God's goal, and it has to be our goal as well, and by the Spirit we can do it. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you for listening and digging deeply into Scripture with Groundwork. We hope you'll join us again next time as we study the prophetic books of Haggai and Zechariah. Connect with us now at GroundworkOnline.com to share what Groundwork means to you or to tell us what you'd like to hear discussed next on Groundwork. Groundwork is a listener-supported program produced by Reframe Ministries. Visit ReframeMinistries.org for more information and to find more resources to encourage your faith. We're your hosts, Scott Jose and Daryl Delaney. Our recording engineer is Dodd Morris. Our post-production supervisor is John Reeder. Our senior producer is Courtney Jacob. 